One of Netflix's biggest hits is a show called Ozark. It's run for three seasons. It's halfway through its fourth and its last season. It's about an accountant in Chicago who's married. He's kind of dis- detached. He's got a couple of kids. His wife's having an affair. He's watching pornographic things on his computer while clients are coming to his office. He sits on one side of his desk. He's periodically glancing at his computer while he's appearing to listen to these people. His name is Marty. Her name is Wendy. And he's got a partner, Bruce. He and Bruce have been friends. I think they go back to college. Marty's a quiet guy. He's a pensive person. He's very, very intelligent, phenomenal accountant. Bruce is one of those guys that just live in large all the time. And Bruce has started skimming money from one of their clients who is a Mexican cartel that they launder money for. And Bruce has skimmed about $8 million from the cartel. They find it and they do not look favorably upon that. So they brutally murder him in front of Marty. They're about to kill Marty. And Marty's saying, wait, 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 wait. No, please, 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 please. please." I mean, he's about to die. And he says, hey, give me a chance. I will pay you back that $8 million. And you need to keep me because I can launder $500 million for you in the next five years. Well, that gets your attention. They'll listen to it. How's he going to do it? He says, we need to get out of Chicago. There's too much FBI and CIA and people looking for us in Chicago. We need to go to the Ozarks. It's rural. It's mid-America. There are not nearly as many FBI agents looking for uh, drug cartels laundering money. So we need to go there. There are a lot of small cash operated businesses where we can wash your money, 500 million in the next five years. And the cartel says, okay, we'll do that. But they keep watch on him all the time. They are tyrants. They beat him. They kidnap him. They torture him. They threaten his wife. They threaten his children. They make him work with some of the most low-life backwood drug dealers. I mean, some real, real crazy rural people that are growing their own poppy fields and growing their own heroin. And he just has to live with the lowest echelons of society and lives a very sinful life. And he's in total bondage and captivity. It reminds me a lot of Romans chapter 6. Because Paul is trying to say, you were born into slavery. You had no choice. You were born as a slave to sin because you were in Adam when he sinned and it's been passed on to you. But when you switch over to Christ, now God moves you from having been in Adam to being in Christ. When you were in Adam, he sinned. That led to condemnation and death. And when you move over to Christ, that brings you to salvation and justification. This chapter is about justification. Justification means God has taken his stamp and stamped you. It's a declaration, a legal declaration. He has declared you to have the righteousness of Christ. You didn't own it. It's not about your performance. I hope that's good news because we live in a performance-based society. And we feel like if we're not performing better than everybody else, we're just not good enough. God takes you out of that performance mentality and says, hey, I've done it for you in Jesus. Jesus' performance was perfect. Jesus got the stamp of approval from God. And God has imputed the righteousness of Christ to you. It's good stuff to know. It takes the pressure off. Justification is the beginning of your freedom. Sanctification is the ongoing process of how you learn to live with the imputed righteousness of Christ and become more and more like Jesus every day. I'm hoping today to motivate you to be more like Jesus, to choose righteousness over unrighteousness every second of every day. Because when you do, you get more favor from God, more freedom from God, and more of the fruit of God 
in your life. It's well worth the effort. Let's back up a little bit and talk about last week. There were three things I tried to encourage you to do. There's some things that Paul is trying to get the Romans to know. He said, no. Then he said, reckon. Then he said, yield. So when it comes to knowing in Romans 6, verse 3 and 6 and 9, he says, no. He keeps talking about those things you need to know. So we look at those things you need to know. In Romans 6, 3, it said, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So you died with Christ. When you died with Christ, you died to the old way of sin. You died to slavery, to sin and disobedience. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. I think you know Satan lies. John 8, 44b says he's a liar. He's the father of all lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. So if it's kind of like a modern day politician. If he's speaking, he's lying. You know, that goes both ways. That's bipartisan. So you know, think about that. And, and that's what he wants you to know this, that you have died to sin. It takes a while for you to get to that place where you realize, I don't have to be a slave to this. You may be a slave to this, but you don't have to be a slave to it. He set you free. So now you have an option to say no to sin. Before Christ, your master was sin, and you had to obey it. Jesus gives you an opportunity. And then he comes along, he says in verse 11, reckon or consider. When we read that, it says, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. What it's going to come down to every moment of every day is you choosing who you're master, who your Lord, who your slave owner is going to be. And I know we don't like that. We don't like being slaves to anything. At least, at least we think we don't, but we often choose every day to make ourselves slaves to sin. We don't have to be slaves to. When you're a slave to God, everything is much, much better. Because when you think about it, he loves you. Let's go to Matthew 6. Let's see some words from Jesus. He wanted, he wanted to tell us something about this. He makes it very clear to us. In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or God and mammon. That word mammon is an Aramaic word. Most of the New Testament's written in Greek. This is an Aramaic word. Jesus spoke Aramaic too. And he tells us this thing, you can't serve God and mammon. It's similar to a Hebrew word that meant treasure or money or something like that. A general definition of mammon are the things of value in this world. So you got to choose between these things, the created or the creator, and you're going to be making choices all day long. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 1.10 said, am I still seeking the approval of man? If I'm seeking the approval of man, I cannot be a bondservant of Christ. Let me make this very clear. It's a polarity. It's one or the other. If you seek the approval of people, you're going to miss being a bond servant of God. But then he tells us in Romans 14, 18, how we can have the approval of people. 
got everybody's attention there. It's kind of, how do you do that? Well, you can suck up to everybody. You can brown nose. There's a lot of different terms for it. So you've got all these different things you can do to get the approval of people. And many people in this city, that is their master. That is their God. That's what they're constantly thinking about is, will people like me? Will they accept me? Will they include me? Will they invite me to their party? Will they do all these things? And they desperately need the approval man. If they don't have the approval man, they're wrecked because that is their God, that's their master, that's what's controlling them. Whatever controls you is your master. And if you let God control you, he is much more benevolent than anybody or anything else that you can make yourself a slave to. So we need to understand slavery. We understand slavery in the United States of America. We studied that when we were in school. It ended with the Civil War, and there was a big dispute, and some people believe we should keep our slaves, and others said we should set them free. And those slaves were people in Africa that had been kidnapped against their will, put on a slave trader ship, shipped to the United States, and sold usually on the auction block. They had no choice. It was not a voluntary thing. But when we go back to the days of Rome, most slavery was voluntary. Well, how would that be? Well, back in those days, when people got themselves in debt, if they couldn't pay their debts, they would be put in the debtor's prison. So they could go to prison and stay until their debt was paid. And when they're in prison, they can't make any money, so they can't pay their debt. So rather than going to prison, they had the option to voluntarily become a slave for somebody. And they'd have to work and they wouldn't own anything, but at least they'd be fed and they'd have shelter because the slave owners wanted to keep them alive. So many people chose to be a slave. That's hard for us to process that I would ever voluntarily become a slave. And yet we do it every day. Whatever we obey, whatever controls us becomes our slave master. This is what God's trying to say to us today. You are a slave. The choice you have is if you're going to serve sin, which is going to lead to condemnation and death, or if you're going to serve a loving God who sent his only son so that you might have life and have it abundantly. There are two forces that we experience every day. There's a destructive force and there's a creative force. Jesus talked about this in John 10.10. He said the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest, that you might have it abundantly. Do you see the dramatic contrast between these two forces? Satan constantly overpromises and underdelivers. He's always doing that. It's a bad deal. You'll get a little bit, but it'll cost you a lot more than it's worth. On the other hand, God underpromises and overdelivers. It's going to cost you something, but you cannot outgive God. It's going to be so worthwhile. So start taking this personally just a little bit. Start thinking about what have I made myself a slave to? Maybe it's something as innocuous as procrastination. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's success. Nothing wrong with success until it controls your life at the expense of your marriage and your children and your family and your relationship with God. It may be business. You may need the approval of people that may control you. How you feel about yourself, your own inferiority may control you because you never feel good enough and you're constantly trying to make yourself feel better, get other people to think you're better. It's like one friend used to talk about, he's just a, a dime trying to look like a dollar. God didn't make you a dime, he made you a dollar. He created you in his image. But Satan has lied so long that, some people's God is just simply bettering themselves. That's a worthy goal, but don't let it become your God. I have friends that have done triathlons. That will take your life over. 
You have to stay on a very rigid diet. You have to train with running and swimming and biking many hours a day. And you have to do more and more and more till race day. You'll dominate your life. I've seen people that have wonderful careers. They may be young attorneys that go to a super firm or accountants that go to a super firm. They'll end up working 80 to over 100 hours a week during the busy seasons when they're getting go to, to trial, when they're getting ready for tax season. Work, work, work. I want to propose to you that you let God be God and subject yourself to him. Obey him. In James, I ran across something this morning, James 3.16. It says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Let that soak in. Where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Jealousy rules some people's lives. They're so jealous. They look around, they see people who have more than they have, and they want to have it, and they think they deserve it, and it bothers them that other people have those good things, and it eats them alive, and every time somebody around them is blessed, it just crushes them. Jealousy will eat you alive. It brings disorder in every vile practice. Selfish ambition does the same thing. If you're totally self-centered, if it's all about you, when you don't get what you want from everybody and everything all the time, you're a wreck. It's a brutal, ruthless slave master, and you cannot win. It's going to cost you more than it's worth. But when we look at the rest of the sixth chapter of Romans, we're going to see when we choose to go with God rather than to be tempted by unrighteousness, God starts increasing his favor and his freedom and his fruit in your life. So in Romans chapter six, we're going to back up just a little bit to verse 12, just a little recap. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Now, the word present or yield, depending on your translation, is going to show up five times in the rest of this chapter. It's an issue. It's a big deal. He says, do not present or yield your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. There's that word grace. In the Greek language, it's charis. It's translated most often grace. The second most frequent translation is favor. Well, what is favor? Oh, my goodness. The favor of God is amazing. God can give you favor with people, with situations, with technology. I need a lot of that. This morning, he gave me favor with traffic lights. I was up at 430. I studied. I got in the shower. I was cleaning up as the ladies and I were talking. Spent a little bit too much extra time grooming this morning. Hadn't spent way too long in hair and makeup. And after that, I was running a little bit late. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to be late because I had to get all this stuff set up in the other room where we had the first two Bible studies. I'm running late, and God gave me favor. There's one light at City Place. It's a three-way intersection. It's crazy. And the one I need, the light I need, has time for about three cars to make it through. It's a fast light. The light's red. I jump on it. I got a relatively fast car, get up to the light. There's some kind of service worker's van in front of me. The light turns green. He sits there. That is what I can hit really hard on my horn. I didn't. I was trying to be righteous. I've been studying this stuff all morning, so I was trying to be righteous. And God's going, hold, hold, hold. And he eases forward. He gets halfway through the intersection. 
and stops and looks because he and then he goes back a little bit because he crossed some of those buttons on the street and he got back and he finally negotiated his way. Well, I'm able as soon as we get through that turn, which is pretty slow. I got two other lanes. I'm around him. Jump on it. Get through the next green light. I, I saw it. It just turned. The walkway had just changed color. So I knew I, I, I've got this one made it through that got to the freeway, got up here, made it, started just in the nick of time, about 629.59, I was ready to go. That was favor. Favor is such a beautiful thing. My mentor of 47 years, Mr. Mansell Charles Ezell, you got to have favor when your first name's Mansell. People never get it right. They call him Manzell. Uh, it's Mansell Ezell. So they shorten it. So, so many people call him Manziel, but he has favor. I've watched this guy. He lectured for 10 years in the White House. They brought him to lecture there. After 10 years, he said, hey, guys, I got to give it up. You've heard everything I've got. It's time for you to get somebody new for this. They gave him a flag that had flown over the Capitol that day. When he retired, he went to work for the Frisk Museum of the Visual Arts, which was founded and started by the Frist brothers, Dr. and Senator Frist. So he has favor with them. Anytime their dignitary friends are in town, of course they want their friends to see their museum, which they converted the old Art Deco downtown post office. They bought it from Nashville for a dollar with the agreement they'd make it into a public museum. So it's the Frist Museum for the Biblical Art or for the, the visual arts. And he went to work there. Well, he got in more hours than anybody else. And anytime the dignitaries come, Senator Frist checks with him to see if he could do the guided tour for them. So he might have four people on the tour followed by 10 guys, black suits, black ties, bulge under their jacket, earpiece, dark glasses, that secret service that goes everywhere they go. He gets all those tours. As I've traveled with him, as we've done seminars and conferences together, it seems like no matter where we go, people know him and love him and roll out the red carpet. That is God's favor because he's a loving, gentle, righteous person. God will give you favor. When God's favor is upon you, people in heavy traffic, We'll stop and slow down and motion you to come in. When, when you're in line, people will just escort you to the front of the line. It's a supernatural gift from God, and that comes as you continuously choose God over the other slave masters. So we look at that. He talks about this grace, and then we get into the freedom. Verse 16, do you not know? that if you present or yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Folks, this is the dilemma of the ages. I invite you to reckon this thing out, consider it, ponder it. Look at those areas where you know you're disobedient to God. I'm not going to start calling names. You know. And just, just consider, just reckon what would happen if you obeyed God. You know, I had two men's groups this morning. Lust is usually a common thing with men. And I just invited them, would you just take a moment and think about how you feel when you're lusting? Is it a good feeling? Your first answer is probably, yeah, I'd love to. But analyze it. Think about it. It's a feeling of lack of satisfaction, lack of fulfillment. There's an angst. There's a restlessness. There's a dis-ease about it. Well, Satan is a master at marketing. I mean, he can make a pig look wonderful, and he does that all the time. Some, sometimes people are mastered by procrastination. 
I was a procrastinator all my life. And my mother helped me remember that on a regular basis. And when I got to graduate school, a guy, God sent somebody. He sent a prophet to speak to me. I was studying one night in the dorm. This guy stops, walks by the room, comes back in, sits down. I said, hey, Greg, I'm sorry. I, just, I don't have time to visit tonight. And he didn't leave. And he just simply gave me a word from God. He didn't say, I have a word from the Lord for you. May I present it to you? He wouldn't gracious like that. He just said, hey, you have to make a decision of who you're going to believe. Are you going to believe God? Or are you going to believe Satan? John 8, 44b says Satan's a liar. He's the father of all lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of sound mind or self-discipline. So God says you do have self-discipline. Satan says you don't. Who are you going to believe? Grabbed his stuff, walked out the door. Got my attention. I thought, you know, I never looked at it that way. God says he has given me self-discipline. It's also a fruit of the spirit. That was the day. That was the moment I became a good student. First time ever. I skimmed through school, through high school, college. You know, wouldn't start studying for a test till at least 11 o'clock at night, usually later than that, cram all night, not remember anything two hours after the test. Not a good student. I decided I am. I'm going to believe God. I do have self-discipline. What is it that God says about you that you don't believe yet? God says you're good enough. He says you're created in his image. He says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you believe that? Except for I'm too heavy or I'm too skinny. What about other things? You have the mind of Christ. Some of you feel like I'm not smart enough. I can't do that. Some of you think I can't do that. Look at scripture. God says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Satan says, no, you can't. Who are you going to believe? Some of you think, well, God's not supplying my needs. God says he is. Who are you going to believe? Satan says, oh, man, look, look, look at all the people who have more than you do. Look at all the people. Okay, he's got a good point. Look at all the people that you are much better off than. I'm pretty well confident that everybody in this room, bare minimal, is in the top 5% of the wealthiest people on the planet. But when we look around, we feel like we're the bottom 5%. We live in a bubble, but we're blessed. Do you believe it? Just believe God. So he goes on. Let's talk about freedom some more. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin or have of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Now, that's how you do it. This is the deal. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. I think our churches today, all different denominations, are filled with people who know about God, but they don't know God. I was one of those people. I learned, I grew up in the church. I was enrolled in Cliff Temple Baptist Church before I was born. They called it the cradle roll. They knew I was coming. They could see it in my mom. So they were increasing their numbers. So they added me to the cradle roll. I counted for one. Before I was even born, I was a member of that church. So I was born. I learned to say mommy, daddy, and Jesus about the same time. I grew up, I memorized all my memory verses. I went to a Christian university, went to a Christian seminary, and still didn't know God. Scripture says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. However, I think I confessed with my mouth and believed in my head. I realized as I was preparing for this for the last 37 years of my life, one of the things I do professionally is help people move things from their head, from their conscious mind into their hearts. 
I think most people know because they've been told all their lives, God loves you. But a lot of them don't feel it. I knew a lot about God, had a lot of doctrine, lots of theology. Most of it hasn't changed that much. It was pretty solid from the beginning. However, I wasn't feeling it. And after I started having experiences with God, that's when it moved into my heart. When I felt his love for the first time, I'll never forget it. When he draws close, I cry several times a week. And a lot of times it's just simply because the the Lord moves close and he pours more love into my heart. It's just an overflow. It's just an emotional overflowing of his love. And his goodness, but he gives us freedom, and that freedom grows every time we choose God. We get more freedom. He knows what he's doing. Many of us grew up in churches where we kind of had this feeling, not necessarily a theological idea, but the feeling that God was an angry old man on a really big throne. The earth was flat. He's above the clouds. He's looking down. He's watching. He's got his binoculars. And if you cross the line, if you disobey him, he's a big enough of an egomaniac. He's going to get you because you said not to. Well, why? Because I said so. Any of y'all ever grow up with that? You quiz your parents and say, well, why did I have? Because I said so. You know, God does not have a human ego. God is pure love and light and life. And he doesn't give us these rules and regulations because he can. He does it because he loves us. God knows what works. Here's the instruction man. It works. If you don't believe it, check it out yourself. I spent most of my life doing that. He was right. There was a lot of pain and suffering along the way because I disobeyed him. And I was a good Pharisee, outside squeaky clean. But on the inside, disobedient. So when you start to cooperate with him, when you come into agreement with God, everything gets better and better and better. He gives you more favor. That makes you feel better. That brings you more freedom. That makes you feel better. He gives you more fruit. That makes you feel better. The better you feel, the better you attract. When you're sinning, it's a downward spiral. You sin a little, you feel more guilty. Sin a little bit more, you feel more shame. So you get a little bit more trouble, and it's just going down and down and down. That keeps you feeling really bad. You begin to attract bad things. When you obey God, he's going to help you feel better, and you will attract good things. He knows about physics, Newtonian, quantum physics, spiritual physics. He knows everything. He's a pretty good consultant. He wants to be your counselor. He wants to be your advisor. He wants to be your stockbroker. He wants to be your boss. And he is going to lead you wisely. I look back to the best managers and bosses I had in my life. The best ones were the toughest ones. One of them that I worked for at Gloria Baptist Conference Center, Phil Bennett, is now in his 80s, a missionary in China somewhere. He had a $20,000 price tag on his head in the Vietnam War. He was in naval intelligence. They had to pull him out because they kept raising the bounty on his head. He was the first divorced person to ever graduate from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, made straight A's. He was tough. I never messed with him. I knew he would whip me bad if I didn't do what I was supposed to do. We met once a week. I've never worked with anybody who was more fair or did more to be sure that I succeeded. So once a week, he said, we're going to meet weekly. We're going to talk about the coming week. You're going to tell me what you're going to do and how you're going to manage your program. And we're going to evaluate the week that just went by. Well, he knew how to think ahead of a 22-year-old college student. So he helped me plan ahead. He helped me become successful. And I did what he said, and I learned, and I grew. When I was at Lake Point Baptist Church, Steve Stroop was an absolute genius. He was a master at administration. He was visionary. He was evangelistic, fabulous teacher, fabulous preacher, 
amazing counselor. He was good at all things. That's how he built a church that has 40 or 50 or 60,000 people in its multiple locations every single week. He was tough, but he's the only person that I felt like he would run backwards and say, come on, faster, faster, faster. You can do it. You can do it. Come on, come on, come on. I never caught up with him, but he let me run as fast as I possibly could. And he I told him what Phil had done. He adopted the idea and we started having uh, quarterly retreats for the leadership executive staff. And he did the same thing. He would force us to plan ahead the next three months and we'd review the last three, three months. So we always knew there's going to be a reckoning, an accounting for this in another three months. And it helped us become better. So the more you obey, the more freedom God gives you. My parents let me take a road trip when I was 16 years old, just had gotten my driver's license all the way to Louisiana to see some cousins. You know how dumb you are when you're 16? I'd driven about, I don't know, 100 miles, a couple hours, realized I forgot something. What did I do? I drive all the way home. I think it was a cap. Could have bought another one for a dollar back then. You just don't know. You haven't had those life experiences, but God gives us more freedom. The more we demonstrate, we can handle it. And he's gracious as we make mistakes and learn. He forgives us. He gives us another opportunity. But the key here is that you become obedient from your heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed. See, back in the days of Paul, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes had made themselves slaves to the law. And they'd taken the Ten Commandments of God and expanded those to 613 rules and regulations. And with those 613 rules and relations, their whole life was about keeping the rules. I grew up to be a Pharisee. I'm good at the rules. I like black and white. There's a lot of advantages to that. However, it's not what God was looking for. And those guys would worry so much about, you know, if the tailor forgot and left a threaded needle in his sleeve where they'd always have some threaded needles, they just, but if he left it in his sleeve and he took a step on the Sabbath, he would violated the Sabbath because it was considered work. I mean, it was ridiculous the things they did. And this is where we've always, Paul's been talking about this in chapter five and six, is there were two groups. There were the liberals and there were conservatives. The Romans were the liberals and the Jews were the conservatives. Well, there's a balance between the two that God's trying to get us to. He wants us to be about the love more than the law. He wants to be us about the relationship more than the rules. And so that's why he says, obey this from your hearts. Verse 19, I'm speaking in human ter terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented or yielded your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present or yield your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. What's he talking about when he says your members? Your hands, you can sin with your hands. Your feet, you can sin with your feet. Your mouth, you can sin with that. Your ears, you can listen to things you shouldn't listen to. Your eyes, you can look at things you shouldn't see. Those are some of your members. Also your mind. Also your will, also your emotions, any part of you, he says, yield it to God rather than to sin. And then he gets on to the fruit that we bear. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. 
that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm going to use the invisible whiteboard now. You got to use your imaginations to stay with me here. But let's just imagine that on this side, we've got three horizontal rectangles. One, two, three. On this side, we've got three boxes, horizontal rectangles. One, two, three. Got that picture? Now we're going to take the words from Romans 6, 23, and I want to tell you why this is important. Learned something many years ago called one verse evangelism. If you ever have a friend who doesn't know Christ and you'd help like to help them understand the gospel, this is a real easy, simple way. If the conversation goes toward God, it's real easy to say, hey, would you mind if I shared one verse of scripture with you? Most of the time they said, that'd be great. They don't know what the Bible says. That would be helpful to them. So you start this way. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages, let's put that in the first box, of sin, second box, is death, third box. Well, what are those things? Wages are what you deserve. It's what you have earned. It's what you have a right to get. Well, the wages of sin is death. Sin pays its debts, and it pays it in death. So you've got wages, you've got sin. Sin is anything that God doesn't like. Sin is anything that separates you from God, and that's death. In the Greek, the word here is thanatos. It literally means separation. When we sin, we separate ourselves to some degree from God, from the most important people in our life, and the most important things in our life. It's just that simple. We separate ourselves from the valuable things in life, just like Adam and Eve did in the very beginning. That's the death. They separated themselves from God. God came looking for them. They hid from him as best they could. Their good relationship went downhill fast when all of a sudden, and so, well, it's this woman that you gave me. He blamed God. He blamed the woman. And it was that that good relationship was over that day. And then they were moved out of the garden. They lost paradise. They lost access to the tree of life. They most lost the most important things in life. Now, let's go to this other side over here. But let's put but up here on the, the invisible whiteboard. But the gift of God, and that third box over here is eternal life. Now you've got wages, sin, death, gift, God, eternal life. They're polar opposites. You've got wages versus gift. Yeah, I was on the internet this week, and two different people tried to give me a book for free. I thought, well, great. One of them was about self-defense. Can't remember what the other one was about, some kind of diet stuff. Or I thought, that's interesting. I'd like to have that. So I start clicking, pushing buttons. And then they just want $19.95 for shipping and postage. The book's free. To me, that's not free. Not free at all because there's a catch. When God gives a gift, there are no catches whatsoever. There's no cost. You can't buy it. You can't purchase it. You want to put a price tag on the life of Jesus Christ? That's how much it costs. You can't afford it. So he gives us this gift of God, which is eternal life. Now you've got wages over here. You've got gift over here. They're opposites. You've got sin. You've got God. Those are total opposites. You've got death. You've got life. Those are total opposites. And then it goes on, but the gift of God is eternal life through, let's put through up over the word but, through, and now let's draw a cross, a big empty cross in between these two different opposite sides. And on the cross bar, that cross, put Jesus Christ. And on the vertical bar, Lord. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That makes it real clear. Oftentimes, I've drawn this on the marker board in my living room when people are interested in God. And after I get that far, I'll hand them the marker and say, would you 
go to the board and just circle the side that you think you're on? That's a tough question. There's no in between. You're on one side of the cross or the other. And a lot of times they have trouble with a free gift. Have you ever noticed how people have more trouble receiving than giving sometimes? I usually reach into my pocket if I realize they're having trouble and I'll, I'll, I'll pull out a bill and I'll ask them, can you believe that's my dollar? It belongs to me. I earned it. I work for it. And I can do anything I want to with it. And I'll take that bill and I'll offer it to them. Okay, I've made you the offer. I'd like for you to have that. Are you willing to receive it? And they look at me and they look at the doll and they usually look back at me and they really don't know what to do with that. Then I usually pick it up and hand it to them. But they don't take it. It's hard. It's free. They haven't done anything to earn it. And eventually they might be able to get it and eventually they might re realize the only way to go from wages, sin, and death to the free gift of God is just reach out and take what God has offered them. I'll close with this story today. Years ago, I went to San Diego on a work project. I found a little vineyard church that was a block from the Pacific Ocean that was meeting in a bar. Cool place. The worship leader there was a guy named Mark McCoy. Mark had grown up in La Jolla, he was a surfer, long, blonde hair. He was a musician, really good guitar player, singer, songwriter. Before, during his teenage years, he'd started five different bands in his garage in La Jolla. I mean, he really was a rocker. He played with some big bands. He was on The Tonight Show at one point in time, had a great career. But by the time he was 19 years old, he'd been involved in drugs and alcohol. He was addicted to heroin. At 19 years old, he kicked the heroin addiction. At 24, he got off alcohol. He gave his life to Jesus. And he went from being a slave to sin and drugs and alcohol and the rock and roll lifestyle to a slave for Christ. He wrote more music for the Vineyard Music Group than any other of their writers except for one. He was the number two most published and produced songs. He spent the rest of his life writing songs about God. Now, we talk about the wages of sin is death. Because of his drug and alcohol abuse early in life, when he was 39 years old, he was diagnosed with lymphoma. And four months after that, he was dead and gone. But he went from being a slave to sin to being a slave to God. And he was one happy guy. In his concerts, he'd just be rocking it. He did a lot of things in public schools with a lot of teenagers. And he'd just go through a verse of song, stop abruptly, look, smile at these kids and said, man, I am so happy to be here. You know, a lot of my friends aren't here anymore because of drugs and alcohol, but it's so good to see you guys. You're so full of life. You got your whole life ahead of you. And he just soft pedal who they could be and how good they could be and what they could do with their lives. He changed a lot of lives. He enjoyed life to the fullest. He experienced the abundant life once he gave his life to Jesus.